it seems that we continue to see more restrictions on Hong Kong and they're limited, very limited at this point, democracy that they still have going on. What's the future for the city at a time when their economy is also taking such a big hit? Sure. Well, I think it, it seems quite clear that there are some impending changes coming at the two sessions meeting in, in, in Beijing next month um, to change the electoral system even further in the direction of really making this the elected officials in the in Hong Kong resemble an, an, a sort of unquestioning echo chamber for for the government. So the question is what impact that will have on actual governance and on policy and of course what impact it will have on business. Also, what impact will that have between U.S.-China relations? We continue to hear more from the Biden administration continuing some of those uh, very tough policies on China. If we see more of Hong Kong's democracy being eroded, will we see a, 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 perhaps a stronger reaction from Washington? It's unclear. Um, certainly, the magnitude of what's being envisioned for next month would, uh, is likely to engender a reaction from Washington. Now, that could take the form of sanctions or it could take the form of, of specific statements. It could also take the form of some additional congressional action on Hong Kong related issues. And uh, the Congress is, is, I think, at this point, it's fair to say, tougher on these issues than even the U.S. administration. On the flip side, the, the question is, do sanctions actually accomplish much in terms of impacting China's behavior? To date, they, they haven't really. So I think the, the question in my mind is really, again, what, what is the impact going to be on the business community? Um, you know, the business community doesn't really look to the legislative council or the district councils um, for that much direct assistance in terms of day-to-day -day operations. But those institutions do have an impact on broader questions about the quality and transparency of how the Hong Kong government operates, uh, the maintaining the independence of the judiciary, and then the whole question about data privacy, issues like that. So I think there, there will be some repercussions, but I think we're going to have to wait and see exactly what comes down and, and how it plays out. When it comes to the future of Hong Kong and the influence of Beijing, a lot of analysts say this is essentially a fait accompli, right? Does that you know, in perhaps a more perverse sense, add just more certainty to the business landscape? Well, I think that there are a certain uh, class of businesses that um, will find the new Hong Kong uncomfortable for, for various reasons. And I think data privacy is a very important question going forward. I think that there's a larger group which will adjust to the new reality and realize that there is an enormous business opportunity still in the city, particularly given its close proximity to China and unique access to Chinese finance and business. So I think it, there's, a, there's a bit of, of on both sides. And on balance, um, you're right to, to suggest that some businesses will, will just price in <clears throat> these changes and then move forward. But I, I don't think that the changes are cost-free. In terms of the areas of collaboration that we could see with the new Biden administration and Beijing, does, uh, you know, taking a stand on Hong Kong, uh, does taking a stand on Xinjiang and some of the more sensitive political uh, topics, does that prevent them from being able to collaborate and be able to build a more, you know, substantially, uh, I guess, beneficial relationship than under the Trump administration? I hope not. Um, Beijing hasn't actually clearly signaled yet whether um, friction in the area of democracy and human rights will be a deal breaker for them in terms of actually <clears throat> entering into negotiations with the United States on economic issues or cooperating on issues like the coronavirus, climate change, North Korea and the like. My guess is that it'll be a mixed picture that that uh, China, there, the the inevitable disagreements on Xinjiang, on Hong Kong, et cetera, will make it harder uh, to cooperate between the two governments, but not impossible. Uh, it just, it's going to require a lot of, of effort going forward. So what would be the low-hanging fruit in cooperation at this point? Um, interestingly enough, I think some of it is outside the region. 
I think that the U.S. might look to China to be supportive on a uh, renegotiation of the Iran agreement. Um, it could look to China to be supportive in other aspects of Uni United Nations issues. And, uh, and then also on the North Korea question, um, China plays a, a, you know, a critical, if not the critical role in um, make, preventing that situation from getting out of hand. And I think that, um, that there needs to be coordination. And I, I think there probably will be between Beijing and Washington on, on, on those issues. You're a, you're a career diplomat. You've also been based in Tokyo as well. You've worked towards the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which, of course, the U.S. withdrew from. Uh, looking at the different perspectives out there, where do these third uh, countries stand? Uh, how can they balance uh, in this environment where you have this confrontation between the U.S. and China, countries like Japan, countries like South Korea? Well, I think that, that they will um, successfully uh, to varying degrees, align with the United States on, on many issues, but also uh, pursue their own course uh, in terms of particularly economic relations um, with China. I think it really varies country by country in terms of, of what exactly what balance they'll strike. But if, if the last few, few years have taught us anything is that there is, in fact, room to maneuver for um, third countries, for Southeast Asian nations, um, Northeast Asian and others to work with both China and, and the United States. That, to be honest, I think frustrates both China and the United States, um, but, but it's become a, a fact of life. And, and you know, if you look at, you mentioned the TPP, the reason that that is still exists and has gone forward and is accomplishing a lot in terms of opening up markets in, in the, in the Indo-Pacific is because other countries, not the United States, not China, stepped in and took the leadership role. And I think that that, that pattern could continue going forward. Kurt, we talk about, you know, just before the, the separation of the human rights and democracy frictions and being able to collaborate. It's interesting, we heard from uh, President Biden's nominee for number two at Treasury saying that they're planning to take a more holistic view of that relationship because, quote, he says, we have to look at it all because that's the way the Chinese look at these issues rather than separating economic uh, and security issues as the agency had done earlier. What does that mean to you in terms of some of the tools that Treasury could take to continue putting pressure on Beijing? Well, Treasury's specific toolbox is in the macroeconomic sphere where essentially it's a matter of coordination with other major economies, including China, on financial policy, where there is a, a discussion about uh, the degree to which U.S. companies should invest in Chinese companies. And I'm most keen to hear the Treasury Department um, speak on that issue. And then Treasury has a statutory role in the implementation of sanctions. The sanctions policy tends to be set by the White House uh, with advice from the State Department, but Treasury will be very important in that regard as well. Is that a reaction that we could continue to see, or are, there, are those tools that we continue could continue to see being used, particularly when you, you talk about the, you know, the security, the privacy, uh, technology-related future of Hong Kong and how Chinese, uh, Chinese influence could play into that? So I think that the, you know, technology, Hong Kong is not a major technology producer and, a, and a, only a, a, a taker of technology. The, I think this data issue is really very, very important. Um, Hong Kong is on the outside of the Great Firewall of China. And to date, people have been able to um, feel quite confident that they have control over the privacy of their data, both in a legal sense and in an operational sense. Um, some of that operational confidence has been eroded. Uh, if the legal confidence also falls apart, then I think people will have to at least, at the very least, change their method of operations uh, to compensate. Uh, and I think that that's a, a really important issue for a lot of companies to be paying close attention to.